architectural delight. Oh, that's right. We're talking architecture. If talking about beauty is wrong, we don't want to be right. Eclectic, modernist, futuristic, guardian, cutting edge, rationalism, vernacular, visionary, pre-postmodern, romantic, invention, beauty baby, beyond style, with your architect hosts, David Andreazzi, Elizabeth McNicholas, and Dan Morales. Architectural delight, baby. Yeah. Feel me? Oh, come on. Let's get it. Ow. Ooh. It's all here, folks. Look no further. <laughs> don't, don't go anywhere. Right here. Architectural delight. Welcome. Um, welcome to our first uh, Architectural Delight. Um, just to give you an idea of sort of what we are and where we're going, uh, this is these are intended to be sort of loose fireside chats with friends of ours, um, really sort of discussing about what is beautiful in design in our environment and architecture without talking about style, without, talk, without being polemic about it. Um, because we do believe that we've, we, we've created this world now where people take sides, but the majority of the world doesn't care about that. And so how do we sort of resonate with them? Um, so my first, uh, my first guest is, is a dear friend of 35 years, um, uh, Michael Ember. And Michael and I met uh, working at Chopina Wharton together um, as young scribes. Um, Michael is one of the leading classical and traditional architects in the country, period. Um, in addition to that, he's spent his life sort of trying to move the, the world to a better place from a design standpoint um, in, with a core of education, both supporting um, within institutions and then outward toward the public. Um, his office is based in San Antonio. Um, his awards are, are numerous. They go on forever. They start with an Arthur Ross Award, which is basically the Hall of Fame of the ICAA. Um, he was inducted as an AIA fellow. Um, the Texas Society of Architects celebrated. Um, he has four Palladio Awards, which is, again, the highest classical traditional award you can get. He has four of them, in addition to ICA local Texas chapter awards. Um, he's currently a visiting professor on an R.A.M. Stern grant at uh, Yale School of Architecture. Please introduce yourself and why don't you start with Yale and talk about the kids and what's it like sort of talking to young architecture students that are sort of affected by all different things, modern, traditional, in, in style. Oh, one second, one second. You're, you're silent. Unmute. Uh, unmute. Okay, go. Thank you, David. Thought you were doing that on purpose. <laughs> so, and, and I still recommend that these happen in the afternoons we're going to have a proper scotch by our side and <laughs> we're going to have a that. so um, yeah th thank you for the wonderful introduction uh, yeah right out of the bat yell so yell um, has been an amazing experience I, I can't you know I think many people understand that uh, that as a teacher, you really learn more than as a student. And so these, these students have been teaching me a lot about how to think about architecture and how to think about what it is we're, we're doing in this world. And, and especially through fresh young eyes and, and this thirst for understanding why we do what we do and why we've done what we've done in the past and, and what matters today. Uh, I think the most rewarding thing 
in in teaching has been this engagement that these young adults really have with wanting to make a difference in architecture and make a difference in, in the communities in which we work. And so, so uh, that's really what the studio has been centered around is, is understanding who we are as communities and understanding what's important to us, what's meaningful to us and how as architects, we can come into these communities and connect with who these people are and have an understanding of who they wish to be. Uh, rather than what, what happens so often today is we have a tendency to parachute in and prescribe our own ideas on, on these communities without regards to what's important to them, uh, but only through our own lens and often an academic lens, which is disconnected. That, that, that's, that's amazing. Um, Dan, could you just check to see some, I'm getting a little bit of uh, uh, reverb back, just, I don't know whether it's you or just, just check it out. Something is coming back at us. Um, I think it's amazing that you bring that, you bring that up, that, 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 that the students are concerned about their role, because that's sort of where my first question was leading, is, you know, what is our role uh, beyond, you know, look, everyone thinks it's, it's, it's about getting fame and, and, and fortune, and, and really, I, even early on, I saw sort of branding and networking is sort of a bad thing, like something you do in the yellow pages. I, mean, I really didn't get it. Yes, I mean, I guess that's important too to get out there and get your name out there. But the thing that I think you've taught me, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about, Michael, is, is that your ability to network and meet people, to learn from them, and which you've taught me to network, to have friends and comrades, and then to actually use that to make change, because that's actually the most, the biggest thing that I've learned from you over the years. I, you know, I, I think that's interesting. I think we all struggle with um, how do we share our ideas? How do we, how do we have people reflect in on what we do and recognize what we do as, as being important? Uh, I think the the way I've always sought to do that is to find to seek out common minds and common voices, and you know, build a lo a louder voice through that. And often that's through your professional peers, right? You know, and you're you begin those conversations with your peers, and if what you have to say is something they feel is important, then then you have. A, a louder voice to which to, you know, be able to convey what you feel is important in this world. And it's, it's just like what we're doing right now, right? You know, if, if you didn't believe through our casual conversations and what I have to say, I wouldn't be on this program today and be able to share with anybody else uh, what we feel is important in architecture and what we feel is important uh, to the world as we begin to think about our built environment moving forward. So uh, to me, you begin there and all else will, will follow. I don't, I don't think you can, you can get very far as a singular voice in this world. It's interesting that, um, and, but again, getting a, get, be, becoming an advocate, which is interesting, like your work in the ICA and then the ICA and then SOAN and then Luchin's Design Leadership Network, you're always focused on sort of, or I guess we all are, I think this is what we need to teach people is that we have a responsibility to leave the world in a better place than we, we, that we came to it. And which relates to right, good architecture, right? I mean, when you, do, when you do, at least my perspective is it irrespective of style, right? Architecture should be respective of the past, it should be respective of today, and it should be respective of the future. And to teach that is our job. Well, you know, I think that's important, you know, and, and you know, what you just mentioned, you know, all of my involvement with those organizations has come from passion, right? I, you know, I just follow what I love. And, you know, through that involvement, you know, I'm able to 
touch broader communities and, and you begin to have your broader conversations about, about those things I'm passionate about. Uh, you know, Yale was one of those opportunities, you know, being the uh, Robert, I, Robert A.M. Stern visiting professor of classical architecture, I could have come in and, and tried to teach the canons of classical architecture, uh, you know, and not that it's not important because that's not being taught in most universities today. But really what I wanted to talk about was what happens further down the line and, and how those conversations get generated at more of a grassroots level. And I think that's what you're good at, is, is really having these grassroots conversations. And so, you know, what is, what is important to the common man? What is important to uh, you know, the general community at large? And how can we tap into that and begin to reverberate what's authentic and what's meaningful, you know, to those communities? And I think that's what, to me, I, I, I feel like, that is what architects are weakest at doing. Um, they have the tendency to be polemic and they have a tendency to uh, be echo chambers and simply you know, voice academic ideas that don't reverberate at the common level. And so we're not gonna get very far if we can't connect with the common man. Can I, can I, hi, hey, Michael, <laughs> sorry to interject. Um, can I repackage what I think I'm, I'm hearing both of you um, saying and see if you agree? I'm presuming, you know, with all of the different sort of, you know, extracurricular outreach um, and involvement um, that you have sort of undertaken over the course of your career, um, there are you know, entities that are, you know, fertile ground for sort of, you know, our own classical traditional echo chamber type ideas. Um, there are entities that have you, have you come up against many brick walls and has that sort of um, led you to uh, a, a space where you might see greater value in engaging with the young architectural uh, uh, students and academies? Well, I, I think the, the biggest brick wall that I recently hit that got a lot of recognition was um, you know, building classically at the federal level. Um, yeah, there, you know, and I, 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 I hate to get involved with this, this conversation because it's become so political and it's not a political conversation. Uh, but what happened was when uh, the Trump administration advocated for uh, classical building on the federal level, the AIA came out strongly against it. And not only came out strongly against it, um, they stated a, a lot of reasons for coming out against it. And one, as a fellow in the AIA, uh, I, I feel the AIA should be more agnostic and, and their opinions about architectural philosophies. And two, I didn't feel like stating the falsehoods that they were stating could go unanswered. So as a fellow, I wrote an open letter to the AIA um, addressing each, each of their claims. And that, that letter reverberated not only nationally, but internationally. Uh, and so, Whereas I'm not a I'm not a political person, I, I don't like to get involved with those those political you know dialogues. Um, this was something that was directed directly at the profession, and the and the way we practice and the way we reflect culture, and uh, and how we build for the future, and and felt that uh, this this brick wall that the AIA had put up uh, needed to be answered to. So um, that was uh, something I, I did not seek to, uh, to create big waves with that letter, but uh, that was an instance where there was a wall put up and I had to answer to it. And there was a lot of uh, reverberation from that. 
Yeah, any but... signs of any cracks in that wall? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's interesting as as we all know, Washington, it's uh, I, yeah, it's it's a very divided city. It's become more divided over time. Uh, yeah, what I think what's sad is uh, because of that statement, the um, uh, the um, the Commission for Fine Arts has always been a non-political entity within Washington and has uh, always given a, an even-handed guiding hand towards what good architecture should be in, um, in, the, in the federal district. And for the first time in 110 years of its history, uh, the current administration has gone in and remove several classes from the commission um, because they did not believe in that philosophy towards federal building. So uh, it's that's just so disappointing when you see uh, something that's that's more of a, a public commentary that becomes more politically um, uh, motivated, and um, it's it's a sign of our times, unfortunately. Uh, that we continue to divide. Wonder whether I mean, you know, is is anyone? Have, are you aware of anyone having discussions now about um, whether or not the AIA should be focusing on aesthetics, period, versus advocating for all of its members, which presumably, um, you know, represent the full spectrum of um, you know design ideals. You know, Elizabeth, it's it's unfortunate that at the national level, no. Um, yeah, again, it's 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 disappointing. You know, it's it's disheartening. It's you know, often we consider what is our our, our membership to a professional organi organization mean if you don't have a voice in it, especially as a fellow. <laughs> uh, fortunately for me, uh, the Texas Society of Architects is a much more open-minded organization or sub-organization of the AIA. No, and I was shocked. Chicago's the same. Sorry to interrupt, but Chicago, you would think <laughs> if anyone, if anyone would have a strong stance on, on aesthetics, they're, they're actually, they've actually been yeah. remarkably supportive of um, the ICAA when it came to town, et cetera. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Texas Architect has a very strong publication. It's probably one of the strongest chapter publications of the AIA. And was more than willing to publish my letter, more than willing to have me write articles on the subject, uh, very open-minded you know, and, and being a part of the conversation. And so it's, it's, so it's good to know that that's closer to the grassroots level. Unfortunately, it's not transcending to the upper levels. The, the interesting thing about the AIA, and I, I joined the AIA in 19... 85 and I left the AIA in January and I've been dedicated on a local but mostly on national level and um, put a lot of time and a lot of love into the AIA. Um, one of the things that I learned early on when we were with a small group of people developing CRAN, the Custom Residential Architecture Network, is that like 86% of architectural firms do some sort of traditional or classical architecture. Right. So how, how you basically can take money from these people and provide no support. I was okay for 35 or how many years not having support, but last year began the attack against us. And that's what was the final straw. It was, it just seems like a really odd thing that, that they would want to be inclusive just for the money aside from the fact that they're responsible to be inclusive to all uh, member architects. It's an odd situation for sure. Uh, no, no offense, no. Go ahead. Oh my God. Go ahead, Elizabeth. <laughs> so no offense to our AIBD friends, but I mean, you would think given that what you're observing, David, you know, uh, something, so, uh, a better area for the AIA to be focusing their, um, their energies would be to be ensuring that architects are required for all building projects, for instance, right? 
um, rather than rather than wading into the aesthetic uh, wars such as they are. Well, I think this is the key: is that like if we can actually not talk about this, not talk about style, and just talk about the importance of good design, then there's no there's no opportunity for I, arguing. You know, but I, I think this leads to to a bigger conversation in that. And, and this is something I've, I've talked a lot about recently, is that design is, is no longer in the realm of the practitioners. It, is, it has been, we have been relegated to what the building industry is allowing us to do at this point. This, you know, what, what we've seen happen, and David, you and I have had a lot of these conversations. We were part of a, a group with the Design Leadership Network that was looking specifically at this. That, you know, what happened after you know, World War II is we saw several things happen. One, with the food industry, and we've used this as an example, that uh, the food industry, uh, the farming industry, uh, was the main focus of the energy coming out of the Second World War and that nitrates from, that you know, were used from, from building bombs ended up going into fertilizers that ended up allowing for these mass corporate farms and mass production of food. Shipping uh, was able to increase with refrigeration. And so what happened in the 1950s is that our availability of food became very narrow and very driven by what the industry gave us. Now, eventually there was a reaction to that at the grassroots level. And that was the uh, farm to table movement that you know, local farmers decided to take back you know, what was good food and you know, focus on you know, what was local, you know, understanding the soil under their feet, understanding, you know, what grew in that soil, how that, how that soil affected flavors, how that affect, how that affected, you know, seasonal food and how to deliver something better than what we were getting from industry. Now you can imagine if, during that time, big industry had come in and had convinced the FDA that all food had to be processed and have preservatives. Otherwise, it was unhealthy and you can get sick. You know, there would be no way a restaurant, no way a farmer, no way anybody can serve you anything other than what that approval was or if somebody got sick, you were liable to be sued or any, any number of things. That's where we find ourselves in the building industry today, is that everything has been so codified that if we get outside of what the industry says, this is what you can do, then you expose yourself legally in doing something different. So in other words, if adobe construction doesn't fall within local building codes and you attempt to build an adobe building, you are putting yourself at legal risk because you are not working within the parameters that the industry has set for. Despite the fact that adobe has been around for millennia and is one of the oldest building techniques and, and you know, one that is at the very grassroots level of what we can do as human beings in, in, in terms of you building cheaply, building meaningfully, and building to last. It's, it's interesting um, that I was in Marfa uh, about two months ago, and there was a big controversy going on in Marfa because they have increased property taxes on all Adobe structures because they found that uh, with New Yorkers and Californians moving in, that they wanted adobe houses because uh, they were more charming and reflected West Texas. And so 
the city increased the values on Adobe structures, which then increased tax bases on these structures anywhere from two to 5%, depending on the structure. Well, what that immediately did was it created a situation to where now the, the lower and middle class could no longer afford to build the houses that they had traditionally built you know, for 150 years in, in Marfa that they could build cheaply because the material was either free or, or very inexpensive and they could build to last. So what happens then is then what was essentially the Hispanic community of Marfa ended up moving out because they could no longer afford to live in the housing stock that they had built and had made popular to Marfa because you know, our municipalities had put an additional tax on that construction type. So you know, these are the things that are happening you know, in our world that are nonsensical, right? That if we could get back to the basics, if we could get back to building the way that we used to build, then we can build more cheaply. You know, we can build in a way that is lasting and we can build in a way that's meaningful. We can build, you know, that a person who owns a piece of property can actually build their own home themselves. Yeah, as opposed to hiring somebody in the industry to come in and build it for them. As opposed to buying, you know, the materials from China or from, you know, anywhere else in the world. You know, the building because of this codification that it has driven us towards a consumerism and mass produced materials and that we have to build this way. And if we don't build this way, then we are at risk of architects or even as the, the baseline community of being outside the norm and being punished for it. You got me on the yeah so, sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna try and go i'm gonna try and go in and out and keep putting myself on mute because as i'm gonna see if, if we can improve this static um but let me back to your original point of us not being relevant we've talked about this michael for years is that we basically our institutions over the last three or four decades it's the institutions it's the glossy magazines it's the award ceremonies is basically celebrating the sort of the uh, the sugar high um, modern sort of fun things without handrails and 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 over the top sculptures with program put in them, and I find it hard to believe that the that the world hasn't looked at us and looked at these images and said, well, I don't know what an architect is, but I don't need that service. When in reality, the service of an architect has very has only a small portion of it is art, and the majority of it is to is to guide a person, be a guardian to a patron through the design process and building process, and protect their nest egg. That's the role of an architect. And somehow, if we we've made ourselves movie stars, and I think people are like, well, I can't afford that. That's not me. That's crazy. That's over the top. And guess what? The, the, the mass, they don't care. They don't know about us anymore. Right. What I, I think we, we architects are involved with like 1.5 or 2% of all the, the built fabric in America. It's, it's really quite shameful. <laughs> and, and that only happened after World War II. Um, you know, when the building industry took on a larger role in, in building our environment. Well, you've discussed the importance of craft many times, the person being there the, and relating to even getting um, uh, designs from books that were around and people learning through books. That whole process is gone. But in reality, that was a process of following, uh, following a method of making sure that you didn't veer too far off the track in the old days. Yeah, well, I, I, I think there was 
a different level of education, you know, back then, and that, um, you know, everybody, um, it was, it was valued at a common level to be a part of the community and build as part of the community. And so therefore, you know, when somebody did build, they, they wanted to build in the language of that, of that community. And so that knowledge was shared freely and people use that knowledge you know, to, to build from. And that, that doesn't happen today that, that we've created this pluralism and, and what I call this consumerism in that, you know, just like fast fashion, you know, architecture has become fast fashion in itself and is ever changing. You know, the, the problem with what's happening today is rather than focusing on timeless elements, sustainable elements, you know, that, that are lasting, you know, such as, you know, programmatic use, functionality, beauty, and meaning that the industry and even our professional organization is in our learning institutions, especially, are focused on innovation and really innovation alone. And so if we focus on innovation, by nature, innovation is transient. You know, what's innovative today is obsolete tomorrow. And so that, that not only goes stylistically, and what we think is cool today versus what we think is cool tomorrow, but it also goes technologically as well. And so if we begin to, to rely on the most recent technological advancements, then those technological advancements become obsolete very quickly in today's world. And, and that, that's the title, it's fashion. I mean, you're talking about fashion, something that's beautiful, looks, it looks great, and then it's out of date. I mean, at what point did you do you did we did you make the sort of commitment that, you know, I I want to be connected to culture and history. I want my work to resonate with the local environment. In your case, it started in Texas, and then you've done it in other places throughout the United States and outside of the country. Where did you where did that come from? That first kernel come from? <laughs> I just thought that's how it always should be, right? You know, I I I never thought otherwise, David. You know, even, you know, when I went through school and everybody, you know, and this was, you know, in the eighties when everybody was designing, you know, this cool postmodern stuff, you know, I was looking at, you know, historic Texas structures and, and trying to understand what made them beautiful and, and trying to understand materiality and, and, and that sort of thing. And then, yeah, that interest expanded, you know, to uh, the, American home, if you will, when I came to the East Coast and met you in Greenwich, Connecticut, and started working for firms on the East Coast and understanding the the American language uh, precedent and where those precedents came from in terms of uh, really understanding the depth of that language you know, through your know, culture. Uh, and beyond, you know, the Americas. So that, yeah, it, be, it began very locally again and yeah, expanded out to really understanding where those influences came from. And then I ended up back here in Texas where, again, I'm, I'm focused on the local. The, the, the one advantage I have now as a practitioner is that we don't just do local work. So we do work all over. And that's an opportunity for us to learn all over again when we go into a community to really understand, you know, the culture, the history, the building traditions, uh, the resources that are available, you know, all these things that make architecture true to its place, uh, to gain an understanding of that, and to build from that. So uh, it's been a bit of a cycle in, in my career. Michael, I would love it if you could expound on sort of, you know, that that part of your process and what you actually do when you're starting out on a project that is in a place that's culturally different from Texas and where you are. I, you know, it's, well, that that's interesting because really at the core of what we've been talking about in the, in the studio up at Yale is this idea of mutieta, 
um, you know, which is an obvious you know, Texas you know, term. And what that is, is a lot of people think, you know, when we talk about place, uh, that it just means the landscape, you know, that, it, that it's just this, this loci. Um, it is so much more than just that point on the ground that it's, you know, when, when we think about Mietieta, we, we, we talk about it in terms of being home and think about all the aspects that, that go into our understanding of home. So when, when you go to a place, uh, you know, you understand it's not just the soil, you know, it's not just the plants and the trees, it's, it's you know, you know, it's the birds, it's, it's the, the smell of the air, it's, it's the food, it's the traditions, it's, it's all of these things that make up this idea of home. And I feel architects have kind of brushed that all aside for this idea of innovation and um, you know, continually searching out the new. And so I feel if we can connect to that idea of home, then we're connecting to that idea that is most meaning, meaningful to us as human beings. And in the end, most lasting. You're muted, David. Well, you got me now. You mentioned earlier about this idea of it being enduring, enduring in design, and we use the word uh, uh, resilient. And resilient means it has to be accepted by the local people, has mm -hmm. to be loved, and it's not going to be ripped down because it's not relevant. That mm -hmm. seems so obvious, but like enduring materials, enduring uh, engineering, um, and enduring in design. I mean, it goes back to you know Vitruvius, but like it, if we can just get back to that point and put the ego aside, well, then, then we're going to have something. I hate to use the word green because I hate the word green, but you're going to have something because, that because with green capital is G, with the, yeah, with the capital G, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. I interrupted your thought. What, what was was there a question there, David? No, 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 no. I, I was agreeing. It's resilient, and resilience is in well, design. And I, and I think you know we always often look at, look at that resilience is, you know, if we build something in a landscape. Would it be meaningful to your ancestors, as meaningful to them as it is to you? And will it be just as meaningful to your grandchildren? Okay, so we're not, we're not aiming at a generation. We're, you know, we're trying to make it multi-generational. And if we can make it multi-generational, then it can be lasting. But it doesn't matter what kind of technology you put into something. If you can't, it will be torn down and replaced. It's as simple as that. I have to make a broad observation about um, your work as I, as I know it, Michael. I would say it's sort of like the pinnacle of lovable new architecture. Is that the same as, you know, home or mi tierra? Um, well, I'm, I'm like the puppy of architecture. So, <laughs> so fuzzy. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, of, of course it is. You know, it's, you know, there's, look, you know, there, there are certain words that have been vilified in the profession these days. I mean, you know, beauty, uh, nostalgia, you know, you know, being romantic, being, you know, delightful. Um, you know, I, I once heard an architect at a presentation for town hall one time when, when the people were standing up and saying, but you know, this, this doesn't feel like our community. And you know, the architect, architect said, well, that's, that's nostalgic. You don't wanna do nostalgic. And you know, basically all nostalgia means is longing for something that's meaningful. <laughs> you know, so here we are as a profession telling people that I don't care what it is you want or, or what it is you think is meaningful. This is what I think as a professional is meaningful. And this is what I'm going to need to give you. So uh, I, you know, I, I recently saw a, a lecture 
uh, on, on monuments and, and all the monuments were very abstract and you know, really kind of cool. And in one monument, they inserted a classical figure of a human being. And it was androgynous. It was, you didn't know if it was a man or a woman or a child or an adult or whatever. And this, this classical piece, you know, was laying there with its hand, you know, you know, outstretched, you know, for you to touch it. And it was so powerful. And, you know, after the, the lecture, you know, one student stood up and said, well, you know, all of your stuff is, is abstract you know, why in this one piece did you put a, a, a classical human form? And, you know, the answer to the architect was, well, they made me. And he said, I, I feel like, you know, eventually we'll be able to get beyond this, that, uh, you know, we, it won't be necessary to in, include things like this anymore. And, but yet, you know, it's, it's, Again, to me, it's this as a profession trying to erase what's important to the common man um, for some academic philosophy that uh, will ultimately uh, will will consi consistently change over time. You know, there's there's no way it, it can be lasting because. Uh, the, the academic world is a shifting world in which, you know, um, these ideas change you know, generation to generation. Whereas, you know, because of you know, the mass of commonality of our common culture, uh, these are things that change much, much, much slower than what things change up, you know, in the ivory towers of academia. It, I, I had the opportunity to uh, drive through San Francisco um, and see the um, the federal building, I, I, and it's just it amazes me, uh, like just just how offensive or sculptural it is. I mean, it's just just it's it's just crazy. And I, I tell you an interesting interesting. Then you weren't going to go there, David. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm actually going to turn it around the way I should have in the first place. So about 90, I tell people, about 90 years ago, um, within a three, two to three year period, three buildings were built. Um, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, and Rockefeller Center, the RCA Building. So th these three buildings were all built within three years, 90 years ago. And I pose the question, is that 90 years from today, will one single building from Hudson Yards be up? That was $23 billion. And I can guarantee you that all three of those buildings will be up 90 years from today. And, and the thing that's most interesting about that, Michael, is that if you look closely at all three of those buildings, they're modern. So, so like it has nothing to do with style. I mean, yes, that there's, there are gargoyles on, on the Chrysler building, but the reality is, is that those are very, very modern expressions, all three buildings. They are, but they're inclusive of cultural expressions as well. Exactly. Human scale, right? right? Other aspects. It's crazy. Well, and, and you know, they, they don't deny the allied arts, you know, when we talk about craft, when we talk about um, being able to create things by hand, there's still a human aspect to all those buildings you mentioned. Uh, whereas there isn't a human aspect to Hudson Yards. You know, it's, it's, it's mass produced technical material uh, that is divorced from who we are as human beings. So it is of the building industry, not of man. And so is it possible for those to be meaningful if they're not a part of who we are at a, at, a, at a basic level. As simple as that. It should, it should resonate with people and at all different levels. And as simple as that. I have a side question for you, um, which I just actually heard. I know the answer because I heard you in an interview in Philadelphia, ICAA, answer it. And it, it was your, how did you get your uh, connectivity to art? And you told a story about Job, and I was like, 
I was in the room when, when, when Job was telling you that. And I didn't sketch for the last 35 years, but I want you to tell a story about the importance of art to architecture. Yeah, um, and, and by the way, you know, he, he's speaking of Job Moore, uh, who is a, a professor at Yale. And you know, Job is a modern practitioner, but the difference between Job is, is that he is very understanding. It has a, has a deep knowledge, probably deeper than, than I, of the classical language and the importance of the classical language, even though he practices in the modern idiom. Uh, but you know, where, where David's going with this, you know, we both worked at an office and uh, this, this group of us uh, were always together, always in the office you know, before you know, office hours. Uh, we'd get into the office, warm our hands you know, to our desk lights because it was, you know, 30 degrees in the in the building when we got there. And Job Moore uh, would always disappear at lunch and come back with this book under his hand. And we finally asked us asked him to see what he had done. And, and it was this sketchbook that he carried around everywhere that he went. And every day Job drew in that sketchbook. And it didn't matter if it was a 15-minute sketch or you know, an hour sketch. And, and uh, Job has an incredibly beautiful hand. But this became a subject of conversation in, in the office and really became the first time as a young architect that I understood what it meant to reconnect with graphic language and that it is something that you have to exercise like any other language. And to be able to draw every single day um, created this fluency if, if you will. And I've tried to keep that fluency alive, not only personally, but, but in my office. And you know, the importance of using uh, the graphic language and being able to express ourselves and being able to express ideas you know, fluently. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if, if say English is your, your mother tongue, then there is no translation between what you have in your head and what you're speaking. Uh, if it's your second language, you have to translate and the words can come out awkward or stiff and, and not, as, not as fluidly connected to your actual thoughts. And it's the same thing with drawing. If you get to a point where it's second nature, where it's your first language, then there is no translating what's in your head to paper, it automatically flows. So to think it is to draw it. And so you can work through ideas much quicker. You can work through uh, the, um, you know, the process that's in your head directly on paper without having to translate it and to put it down in a physical form. And so that's, became an, that's become a, a very important part of our practice. And, and what we do. And in fact, we have uh, the MGI Sketch Club, MGIA Sketch Club, which I encourage you all to look up on Instagram. We've got some very talented young people in the office who get together once a week and you know, do a little drawing exercise. And, and it's, it's really helped them become you know, good designers in our office. And you, you have a, uh, uh, Mike's watercoloring is, unbelievable and so go to go to the website you go to instagram and you'll see them they live they live and breathe it but you have a book coming out don't you uh, i do yeah. um, can you tell us about that well we um it's it's just simply you know drawing uh the the importance of drawing it as an architect that's uh on the art of the architect and understanding that connection uh between uh, not only expression, which is, which is important, but more importantly, seeing and observing. And you know, if you can, if you can, you know, we, we live in a digital world today and, and you know, all of us as architects are the same and I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. You, know, you walk the streets of Amsterdam and you're, you, you come away with a thousand photographs. Uh, you come back to the office and you put it on the server and they're stored away and 
you don't think about it again. Um, but you know, if, if you bring your sketchbook or, or you sit and you do a watercolor, um, you slow that world down. Everything comes to a stop and you get this incredible focus and understanding where you are and what you're seeing and observing. Uh, and you begin to make a real connection visually uh, with how you learn about a place. And so uh, that's, that's really what that, that focus is on. Uh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. I, just the, uh, the power of understanding shade and shadow. I mean, going back to the Beaux-Arts, to what you're doing, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing tool. And I mean, to Elizabeth, you were still in Notre Dame. That's the core of your essence, right? For Hi. years. Ah, uh, yeah, lucky us. Uh, what a lucky batch of uh, graduates, for sure. And we've got um, a lot of Notre Dame. I was going to say yes. <laughs> the, the graduates of that program are hot commodities coming yeah. out of uh, career fair. It's uh, um, but you know, it's it's um, it's imperative if you you know are sharing any sort of um, design responsibilities with your staff. They need to have exactly that. What Michael's describing at least some practice at capturing you know that which is beautiful and the proportions and um, just, um, being able to recognize that which is worth studying study it and then hopefully you know your hand your hand sort of knows how to replicate or, or what the rules are um, about how to achieve beautiful things so well and, and we're not uh, and I agree with that completely Elizabeth yeah, we're also not stuck in the in the dark ages. I mean, we we use all the tools available to us. You know, we've got three D printers. We've got, you know, you know, all of the computer programs that you know help us understand architecture and, and be able to put it together um, in, a, in a more efficient way. But uh, to me, the thought processes of uh, how you begin to conceive of architecture starts with how do you take what's in your head? And that's, that's what it means to be an architect, right? That's, that's really, to me, the most exciting thing about being an architect is, is you're able to conceive of something within your head. And if you can be able to express that, what's in your head in a way that other people can understand it and be able to understand how you could put it together to build it and realize it in the physical world you know as as human beings isn't that the greatest gift of all i mean it's it's just astounding to me and what's so exciting about being an architect the the, the interesting paradox is that um the computer i've told them it makes me such so stronger and so faster and so more classical. It's ridiculous because while you can't stop sketching and you can't stop doing the art, when it comes to let's look at the column this way, let's look at this proportion, let's add a bay. Let, I mean, the, the thought that you wouldn't use those tools to make your traditional architecture better to me doesn't make sense. Yeah, you no, know, absolutely, David. But you know, there's there's one exercise you know, we did with our students that was uh, based on materiality, and you know, looking at the difference between wood, brick, stone, and adobe. And I liken what you just said to the materiality of the machine. Right? There's a certain aspect of it that creates a certain rigidness, and it's just like if you use brick as material, there's gonna be a rigidity that comes with that mature material. And so, uh, as opposed to Adobe or you know, some other material, um, there are no restrictions to the hand. It is completely organic. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can force it to be rigid you know, or you could be fluid with it. The machine itself, yeah, forces you into a more rigid view of things. Literally a box, right? Are you literally are you, are you leveraging? And, yeah. And and the, the worst thing about it is there's no scale to the screen. 
And so there's no real understanding of that, that human connection to scale. That makes total sense. I, I, I wanted to just jump in and ask you to go right to uh, talk about what, what is modernity. I mean, I, I, I've always, You're frozen. Poor David, we lost him. I'll tell you what modernity is in my opinion. Get it. <laughs> Here's Daniel, here he comes. Uh, modernity is everything around us and it's what's all around us. And, um, and I guess I take a less bleak view of modernity because uh, you can't really do anything about it. Um, so but the one thing I would add to the whole, uh, you know, um, doing, uh, what you call it, craft versus all that. To me, it, um, the, the thing that we can do something about is design. And design is fun. And I think that's one of the things that is always omitted when they're talking to young people is that, you know, you class designing. And the thing is, not only that, but as a young designer, you want to innovate. So I completely agree that the whole techno, you know, f the, the obsession with technology is, is a misnomer. But the idea that you don't want to innovate is, is I, I, would, I wouldn't put it quite that way because nobody wants to be seen as a copyist or every, everyone, know, even Michelangelo, you know, the Pope would say, you know, I want him to give me qualche fantasia nuova, you know, which means a new fantasy. So they were all looking for the next thing. But the thing that the difference between then and now is that they had empathy towards their fellow man. They wanted to please their neighbor. So when I was at school, for example, at Pratt, I had a hard time with the modernist dogma and all that. And uh, my thing was always design for your mother. If your mother likes it, there's a good chance 90% of the people in the street are going to like it. If your mother doesn't it's like it. It's your Italian mother. <laughs> whatever your background is. <laughs> David you know, knows it's, that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a relationship that you can't fake. You know? And so when you go to these schools and you hear see people talk, and you can see the, the glazed look in kids' eyes, because they know what's happening. They know it's theater, you know, and it's a shame. And so then by the time you graduate, you've got these cynical kids and they, they don't, they lose the whole joy in playing with blocks. And I'm not trying to simplify it. Obviously we, what we do is so incredibly complex and we're such geniuses, but at the end of the day, nobody cares. They just want to walk down the street and be delighted by their environment. Well, David, I mean, Daniel, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I, I try to, tell you know our students that don't be afraid of looking at history don't be afraid of really deep diving into history and begin to draw from it because no matter what you're going to be looking at that through a modern lens you can't escape that and so right. it's through that modern lens that really wonderful things can happen that make it new and so I, I, I don't think it's, it's a fear thing. You know, that doesn't mean that there aren't architects out there that imitate directly. Um, but I, I've always seen us as just a filter of, of history. And, you know, I'm not sitting here before you wearing a cape, you know, uh, like Richardson. You know, I, you know, I'm a modern man. You know, I'm a, I'm a product of this modern world. I use modern tools. I see the world through this modern lens. My architecture is going to be modern. So I, I'd love to. So I'd love to you to talk for a brief moment. You've probably seen more Luchin's houses than most of us in America. Um, and when you're in one of his works, um, you're constantly um, you're presented with details that look out that their experimentation. And some of them, I wonder if I would even left my drafting table until I realized in 3D they're genius because he was that good. Yeah. And he was pushing the envelope, like you said, exploring the canons in a way that was pushing arch architecture forward in a, just a very, very beautiful and graceful way. But I wonder your thoughts on that as you've seen so much of his work. Yeah, I, I think that's why Lutchen's work still resonates so strongly today is because he was uh, a man of his time. You know, he, he was living in a post-industrial world, uh, you know, but yet he understood the rules of the past and how to apply those 
not only apply them expertly, but be able to reinterpret them, be able to bend them, be able to um, shape them into things that have never been shaped before. Uh, he carried the language forward. So he was, he was never stuck in time. And so it's, that that's why his, you, you mentioned, you know, seeing his architecture in person, I think anytime you see a Lechem's house, there's more and more to discover because he's thinking about things in a new way. He's exploring, he's carrying things forward. And, you know, that's, you know, I'll never be a Lechem's, but that's what I hope to do in my own work is to understand, you know, this, all these amazing tools that the past has given us and be able to learn how to use them in a way through a modern lens to create a new architecture for tomorrow. It, if I'm able to achieve that, then um, you know I'll, I'll be happy with my life's work. And just pay you a pay you a compliment, you know, um, sort of acutely on that note. You you've looked so hard at Lechens, and oftentimes architects who are looking hard at you know uh, uh, an architect's work from the past, their own work tends to sort of manifest look like you know a baby version of whoever and um so it's um it's unique it seems unique in the way the lessons that you've taken from your um study of of um Lutchens and others i presume and you've been able to sort of um synthesize that with what seems to be your priority which is the as you mentioned before sort of the Nietzsche and um uh, you know i mean i think that's been the key um to sort of like the the fantabulousness of of what you have um brought into the world so thank you well i i appreciate that i don't know if that's so much naivety or uh just my endless desire to explore that just leads me somewhere else um but uh i i, I take that as as a compliment elizabeth Um, did you, anybody else, do, do you want to answer a couple of questions, see if anybody has any questions from the yeah, audience? I, I would love to. It seems okay, like so there's, there's a lot going on in the chat there. So there's a Q&A button. So if everybody wants to sort of jump in and ask a question. Is your while people are typing? Yeah, it's are, it's are interesting getting... because I I feel like this is such a boring conversation because I'm just stating the obvious and not <laughs> exploring any new ideas. But, um... You're I have, presume you're helping a lot of people feel un alone. <laughs> 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 Misery loves company or something along those lines. Um, Dan, do you have any other? Um, I don't know facts to lay down while we're waiting? Well, I, get, I mean, I'm in Chicago. I'm going to go see the Charlney House in a bit. And then I'm going to go see the Glessner House, speaking of berobed uh, Anglo-American architects, aka H.H. H. Richardson. And, and I saw um, Wright's House uh, yesterday. And I've seen these before. And it always amazes me how everyone goes on and on about Wright. And, and he's a genius. Don't get me wrong. He knows how to play the instrument beautifully. But then you go to Richardson's house and you don't even think about Frank Lloyd Wright. You think about how, what a wonderful place it is to be. And to me, that's, I don't know how you teach that in an inspiring way, but it's the highest compliment that I just want to be there. And it's like a fine piece of music. You, you enjoy it on the surface, but if you're sitting there, you keep uncovering layers and layers of design. And to me, that's the best design is that it's not afraid of pop appeal, Within the within the patterns, there are other patterns and further patterns. So you're allowed to appreciate the song, the frozen music, at any scale you want. It doesn't just say you must come deep or don't show up at all. It, it, please yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 the key to these enduring architects uh, is that they understand or understood the human condition. And they were able to tap into something that lives within all of us, that is innate within all of us, that we all respond to naturally. If we can do that as architects, we will be enduring. 
as David says. Uh, if we can't, we will be transient. Goofy question based on sort of, oh, well, I'm just no, thinking I was about say, That's another one of our fraternity from Sherbert and Wharton. It's Scott McElrath has a question. Ah, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Is it about scotch? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So he said, uh, Michael, with our society seemingly moving away from civility, sadly, do you find it more difficult to connect with delightful, meaningful design? Not personally, because that's what I'm focused on. Uh, I, am, I am saddened by what I see going on in our communities today. You know, I, I live in a community, San Antonio, which is growing very quickly, uh, exploding, in fact. And what you see is uh, building, especially housing, has become a commodity, an, an investment commodity. And so you see these neighborhoods being lost, uh, you know, investors coming in and tearing down neighborhoods and building these white boxes everywhere um, that they could sell quickly and make a profit from. And so in doing so, you know, our, our fabric is, is being torn apart. Uh, but I... Scott, you know me, I'm, I'm focused on what I'm doing and I don't really pay a lot of attention on, you know, what else is happening. Uh, we're so passionate about what we're doing here. Um, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with what uh, is I see happening to our communities um, outside of our control. I find the most disturbing thing right now is this, I call it this, this, this compositional modern architecture where you take nine different material types and basically make a collage on a three-dimensional, three, four-story building. And uh, that, that's a problem. That's a problem with, uh, you know, how we are, are inspired by design today. And, and, and to me, this is, this is maybe a subject for another day, but yeah, the, the problem with uh, what's happened with design is rather than being taught how to conceive of design and conceive of, ev of everything that goes into uh, a realized building, home, whatever, uh, and the integral parts to give that integrity, uh, what's happening is we have a tendency to go to Pinterest, not we, uh, but a lot of professionals have a tendency to go to Pinterest or Instagram or whatever and just simply lift images and say, oh, that's a good idea, that's a good idea, that's a good idea, and try to paste them all together in a montage. So I, th I think that's a real challenge in today's design world, and we're, we're seeing a lot of that. So it's interesting. It's, so it's, it's actually become a style or for the time being until it goes out of style. And Elizabeth can jump on this because she's really more studying and sort of cognition in the brain but to me like i look at that and i see camouflage and that basically tells your brain not to look at it it just it basically confuses you so it's disrupting and being making you threatened and confused just that style right yeah i mean yeah that, that's that's quite right and it's yeah i mean um, along the list of um sort of problems with the design industry, um, I would just add, right, it's, you know, are, are we designing for humans who are going to inhabit these um, places for the long term, or are we designing for the, for the, uh, you know, shop for the cover of the magazine that now has to fit, it's got to fit, you know, on your um, mobile phone screen, and that's all, you know, that sort of reading, um, um, you know, quickly uh, and shockingly or whatever, or sort of being attention grabbing is sort of a, a, an enormous driver for so much of the most successful um, design that's being cranked out these days. And it's, you know, to actually stand next to it as a human being can be a horror, like you say. Um, we have a question, let's see. Uh, ornament is key, but the cost of labor is so challenging. Also, permit fees are so oppressive, the whole process becomes victim and subordinate to finance and fascist oppressors. Have I politicized building? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think that, that goes back to what I was talking about, how the building industry has become so codified. Uh, you know, we, we have, you know, uh, you know, 
the building industry that is creating ASTM standards, green standards, all these different standards that is driving us towards uh, this is the only way to build. Uh, we have uh, the industry and the profession as a whole um, uh, uh, going to municipalities and, and, and having them adopt uh, you know, different building codes and you know, different you know, zoning codes and so on that drive us into a corner that we cannot escape from. Again, it drives us further away from the way that is natural for us to build and has been natural for us to build. Um, and not only because uh, yeah, you know, the, the availability of materiality and so on, but you know, we're, yeah, you know, we're we're getting, yeah, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reminded of you know a scenario where there used to be a, an incredible industry in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Yeah, you know, it was a uh, handmade brick industry, and there are all these beautiful vernacular and classical buildings built up and down the Rio Grande Valley of this handmade brick, uh, buildings that are 150 years old, uh, still, you know, still standing today and, and still very beautiful and a part of these communities. Uh, the building industry came in and created ASTM standards for brick that were adopted, you know, industry-wide for the production of brick. That put the handmade brick industry in South Texas out of business overnight. And so, you know, you, you see the way we used to build, the way we knew to build, the way we knew to build in a lasting way, suddenly discarded overnight by these modern standards that don't necessarily build better, longer lasting buildings. I mean, we see as we improve technology over and over again, we find ourselves backed, in, backed into another corner. You know, oh, now we have to deal with moisture control. Oh, now we have to deal with vapor control. Oh, now that we, we've introduced, you know, this kind of air conditioning, you know, we have to, you know, create, uh, you know, multiple, uh, you know, layers of protection uh, in terms of the envelope that, you know, may not even be necessary for that environment given where you are. Uh, we're continually, you know, enacting, these, these codes and requirements that are forcing us further and further and further away from just living naturally with the lands, with materials at hand. But isn't that, that was your point earlier, and we've discussed this at length about food. It was only 30 years ago at the steps of the Spanish steps that in rejection to uh, a McDonald's, the, the slow food movement was started. In three short decades, they basically have challenged the entire the entire world, and we all go to the market now and think about everything from, was it local? Is it fresh? Are there GMOs in there? This is only three decades long, but isn't that sort of the same thing that we're challenging our people to start to think about and to start to pull back? Like we're in the beginning of that process. How do, how do we take back building from industry, big industry? And, and that's, that's a very difficult thing. And, and I find myself backed into a corner, you know, as a professional, you know, how can I build the way that I know is, is right and natural and be able to convince a client that you know, it's worth the risk. You know, you're, you're spending all this money in building this building, a full masonry building, but it's not the way the industry says to build, you know? So it's, it's, it's tough. And, you know, I, I have to say that there are some professionals that are really out there pushing that front and I applaud them. And I hope we can get to a point where the, you know, the world we bid, build in is like the farm to table world, you know, where we do find a cottage industry that is, that becomes a movement that then ends up changing the industry as a whole. Uh, Michael, we're can not you name names? Yet. Would you be willing to name names, people you think are? I, I think um, what they're doing at Carlton Landing uh, is, is really wonderful in, in Oklahoma, where they're building solid masonry 
brick houses, a whole community of them. And uh, it's, it's really beautiful houses. And yeah, they've really created not only uh, a beautiful fabric for this town, but an incredible community around the people who believe in that kind of construction and that kind of lifestyle. So, and, you know, a community of craftsmen, craftspeople who believe in that, you know, houses built by hand have a soul and are more meaningful because of that. Fantastic. I have a couple more questions. One was going back to the nine materials on a single volume. And the point is made up is that I th that's a device used to break down the scale of the building, which is true. That is the point. They're building a big, most, in most cases, you're building a big square ugly box and they use this sort of uh, freshman technique of putting different materials on it to break it down visually. But again, go back to some of the people that talk about cognitive architecture, Ann Sussman, and there's a whole handful of the next movement of how we're going to be viewing architecture over the next two decades. That it's how your brain is interpreting that information as to whether it's beautiful or not. And it's, and it's not even a matter of checking it off as beautiful, whether it's accepted and loved. Yeah. Well, David, interesting in the way you put it is that you're talking about design. Uh, you're not really talking about craft. I mean, when they're looking at that, it's the collage that's bothering. It's not the fact that the building was handcrafted or not. And I'm a full, full believer in craft. But for 95, 99% of the Americans that, you know, can't get near it, unfortunately, for economic reasons that are beyond my pay scale. You know, I think about on the, on the chat line, or like uh, San Francisco Palace of Fine Arts. That's a concrete building. And it's a jewel. It's uh, considered, you know, one of the iconic buildings of San Francisco, but it didn't have that much craft. The reason it resonates so much is it just was so beautifully designed. So again, I think while we're waiting for craft to catch up and environmental forces, uh, the right government policies can incentivize a longer term sustainable planet that we all wanna, you know, our great grandchildren will hopefully be a part of. But I think one of the ways that we can as architects encourage that industry is by designing beautifully. And that means not, not worrying about, uh, like you say, uh, you know, polemics, things like that. And so my focus is really on academics. When you get the new crop of students, how to get them just to get into it, worry much less about polemics and you know, whether this is of the land and all that, and just get them knowing how to play that fiddle, that design fiddle, which is, can be expressed many ways. And then from there, people will see attractive designs showing up on streets and maybe they'll ask for, you know, I think that at that point, they'll be incentivized to demand for more quality products. But the way things stand now, and I work in the home building industry, it's just, it's not a reality. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing on Pinterest to enjoy, but for them, it's like, it's just economically, you know, that's almost like a political discussion. How do you bring that? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that, Dan. We, we just responded to an RFP for a project in downtown San Antonio where part of the RFP is a new program that the city of San Antonio has started where they're incentivizing the architects and the construction team to work with a training program for craftsmen. And so... Uh, to me, that's thrilling. Yeah, you know, that that is that is a municipality that is understanding that we can add richness to our community by involving the community and building the buildings that become a part of who we are. So, uh, you know, it, it has to start at all levels. Right, and I'll just add one more thing, if I could. Um, I completely agree, and that's that's fascinating that to hear that's happening. Um, I'm on vacation right now in Chicago, and I've been touring all over good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods, wherever the design is good. Um, I've seen an incredible amount of infill, and Elizabeth's from Chicago, she can correct me or however she likes, that's incredibly good. Now, I don't know if that's because that Chicago style, you know, geometric aesthetic that Frank Lloyd Wright pioneered and all these guys developed makes it easier with modern materials to do, but compared to DC and all these other places where everyone tries to do a tricky glass facade or you know that collage design, there's so many infill buildings in these older neighborhoods north of the loop that 
aren't, I mean, I've, I, and normally I just take pictures of 95% are old buildings just for the composition. But I've been taking pictures of newer buildings because I'm like, my God, these guys are doing wonderful things. So I don't know, maybe Elizabeth, you can speak to that, how that's happening. Well, you do, if you've got, if you have good fabric, you do have to be, you know, pretty brave to be the first developer or architect to come and deposit an alien, you know, spacecraft onto the, onto the street. So I do think that there is some incentive to at least, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, fit in we you know the art of making it look new because we have that sort of shortcut in our brain wanting something that's new but you also don't want to be the rude neighbor basically right right um so. well that's what that's what i think is interesting about chicago and chicago's always been this way in that they understand who they are as a design community so you know the problem with cities like san antonio for instance is that uh the small local developer has been pushed aside by all the national developers that have come in to build cheap product. And so uh, through that, we have lost a lot of our identity because they never understood or cared about our identity to begin with. I do, I do, I do getting back to getting art and, or architecture or good design of the masses, which was really our long-term goal. I have a much more optimistic view of it. I mean, when we started in the mid eighties, uh, there was American Standard and Kohler and you had a handful of products. There, there just wasn't a lot out there because it had all basically been stripped by the international style over 50 years. But over the, over the last you know, tw 20 to 30 to 40 years or it's since then, the artists have come back and the demand is out there where people are buying custom made this and fancy light fixtures and fair. So I believe it's sort of going in the right direction. The question is, how do you make that transition from a Norman Rockwell, original Norman Rockwell painting to a picture of it on the refrigerator from the cover of the magazine? How do you give somebody an iPhone, which is really sort of whatever it's hum and card and design, but it's given to everybody. How do we get this good design? And I think we're getting closer and closer, I feel so. I, you're you're talking about at a base level. Yeah, you know, I'm saying compared to where we were three decades ago when we started. I, I'm saying that that has to. I, I'm saying that that has to filter down, you know, to the grassroots level. If if we can't do that, if if it, if design, if good design is only for the wealthy, you know, is is only for those who can afford, you know, to build a thousand dollar square foot house, then what are we doing? We lost. We're, we're not affecting our communities and we're not affecting our building environment at the root level. So we've, we've got to figure out a way to bring design uh, to our communities at all levels. And I think that starts with craft. I, I totally, yeah, that, that, that totally agree. There it is. We have an, uh, a couple more questions. Let me just, are you okay for a couple of minutes, Michael? Sure. I see, um, I would I see say Scott that... Galrath is on his third scotch now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, we miss you, man. Um, so uh, I always say that uh, I am contemporary because I am still alive. I regard classicism as a continuum. Why not just say how we work as traditional classical designers as a modern and elastic as anything else being built? Well, I, I think that's true. And, and, you know, David, you know, we think of architecture as a continuum at all, I mean, as well. We, you know, we try to understand the past as a path towards the future. Um, you know, where we are where we are, but we are where we are because of the past and where we want to be, uh, or where we want our works to be in the future depends on how strong of a foundation we're, we're building from the past. So, uh, and again, you know, I can't reiterate it enough as a contemporary, as David puts it, or as, as a, a, a modern practitioner, you know, we're viewing it through our world, you know, as, as contemporaries. So um, it's, it's through that understanding and how we can move it forward that can make it lasting and meaningful. So great. 
a comment is special interest to hijacked architects in society. I mean, I'd make the argument that architects have hijacked themselves in addition. I mean, no, I, I agree with that comment. Special interest. I mean, you open up any architectural record or, or any architectural magazine and you, you'll see the building industry in full force. You go to the AIA convention. What is the AIA convention? Yeah, is it a convention of ideas and, and how we're, we're creating a, a better impact you know, with our communities? Or is it a material sourcing for big industry? You know, it's, it's, I, I feel like we've really been driven by that and who we are now. I, you know, and as individual practitioners, yes, we've fallen into that trap. Yeah, I mean, again, we're, this is for another day, but the whole concept of lead and green and a million things that, that, that follow that prey down the road, there's a, it's about commercialism first. And a lot of the concepts are things that we, we as architects and designers are just responsible to do. We're responsible for where does it come from? How does it, it, it we shouldn't be given a checklist, but- Yeah, just just understand that, that all of those sustainability councils are, are you know, seated on their boards by big industry. Yeah, it is a brand and it is about driving product. Um, I really enjoyed your description of your joy in sketching in watercolors. Can you describe your render, how your renderings inform your architectural design? By the way, I'm now on my third scotch. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, actually that's very important. And I think, you know, that may be unique to us as, or, or me as an architect, you know, I think a lot of architects especially traditional the rings for their presence on we like to do the shadow i'm understanding how forms come together i'm understanding uh how the texture in the stone changes uh from one place to the next and then that's you know as we try to move uh, the building forward uh but you know often when we're when we're doing the mock-ups you know material mock-ups in the field we're going back to the renderings and say okay why did this work here and how can we convey that in the materiality of this house moving forward so, so you know yes it, it is a rendering it more than that it's it's part of the process of of building and it, and it starts with that visualization well but michael this has been an hour and a half way past your uh, a lot that you promised i promised to make you stay and i, I sincerely appreciate uh, you being here, you really did sort of get me involved with this whole um, commitment in the first place. Again, I'm going back to 2000 when you gave, gave me a telephone call and said, let's, let's see if we can make some change. And um, it's been a fun ride. So thank you very much for being part of this process. Well, David, I, I appreciate it. I, I think you, I, you know, thank you for saying I inspired you to do that because I've, I've seen you do you know, really uh, amazing things in terms of, of bringing people together and communicating these ideas to the public. Um, and that's, that's been a, a, a huge effort on your part that I can see you continuing to do. Uh, thank you again to the ICA New England and Residential Design uh, for helping us out. We are non, there's no financial donations, but their efforts are unbelievable. Um, and again, thank you so much, Michael. I look forward to seeing you with scotch. <laughs>